Hi there, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Artworks for Teachers. I'm Susan Riley, your host, and today I'm joined by Sonia Epstein, who I think you're going to find is a fascinating person to get to know because she is the curator at the Museum of the Moving Image. So she really takes a look at the intersections of science and art through filmmaking. Um, it's so incredibly interesting, um, both her job and how she how she curates those things, how she decides what goes in to that museum, as well as you, you know the process of and thinking about science in filmmaking, um, how to do that, the the science of filmmaking, technology, how that all works together. This is a great steamy episode that I think you're really going to enjoy. Um, and then the other part of this that's really interesting is the idea of um, the position of a curator of a museum like this. So we dig into um, her work as a curator. I, I'm always talking about the idea that opportunity is so important for our students and they can't know about careers that exist if we don't bring this up. So this is certainly a career that we could share with our students and what is all involved in that. And Sonia really goes into that in this episode so that you understand who she is. She is a curator of science and technology and the executive director of the Sloan Science and Film at the Museum of the Moving Image in New York City in Astoria. Um, she oversees the museum's online publication, scienceandfilm.org, which is linked in our show notes, as well as administration of the $20,000 annual Sloan Student Prize for screenplay development. She curates the ongoing film series, Science on Screen, that pairs screenings of rarely seen films with conversations between scientists and filmmakers to offer new perspectives on both film and the scientific subject matter. And if you go to their website, you'll be able to find all of this and more. So I encourage you to do that once this episode is completed. Remember to head on back to the Artworks uh, for Teachers page and you'll have all of the details, show notes, and the download of the Teacher's Field Guide that Sonia also curates. So without further ado, here is Sonia Epstein. All right, welcome, Sonia. I'm so glad to um, be with you today. Can you share a little bit about yourself and your work with the audience? Yeah, of course, happily. Thank you for having me. Um, so I am the Curator of Science and Technology at Museum of Moving Image. We're based in Astoria, New York. Um, so for those who haven't been, I encourage you to come out. Um, and yeah, I'm originally from New York. I came here a lot as a kid. We have um, the museum is full of, you know, less so as a like film archive, but more so as an, a collection of sort of the ephemera or the production elements of the moving image. So we have a lot of uh, old movie cameras, editing equipment, television projectors, um, and you know, old boxes and uh, things that you know, evoke sort of the ideally past, present, and future of the moving image. Which is amazing. We actually, um, we just finished a book club for teachers over the summer, and one of the books chosen was Lights, Camera, Alice. Oh. Um, and so, um, and the author of that told us that she actually went to your museum oh. and was inspired by some of the things that she saw there in order to create the, the work from the book. So um, I'm excited to kind of dig into yeah. your work and, and how you curate those things. So as the curator, um, so talk about your job as a curator of sure. this museum, yeah. first of all. Yes. Well, first off, we have a few great curators on staff. I'm one of a few and, you know, could never take responsibility for, for all of the great things that we do. We also have a very robust educational department um, and I sort of work across departments um, in, with the specific focus on science and technology. So that means a few things. So first of all, we have an online publication. There are two online publications that the museum has. One is called Reverse Shot, which is specifically for film criticism. And one is called Sloan Science and Film, and that's the one that I'm the executive editor of. And as the name indicates, it is an online publication that specifically focuses on that intersection. And we do a large variety of things that includes regularly uh, publishing interviews with scientists, with filmmakers. We have a commissioning series where we ask scientists to review topics in current film and television called Peer Review. Uh, we also have a streaming library of short films. We have an online film catalog, et cetera, et cetera. So I run that. So that means I do a lot of writing, editing, assigning, 
chasing people down, um, promoting, you know, all the things. Um, and then I work some with the education department and uh, on, you know, a more teacher focused guide. Um, and then in the museum itself, uh, for those who have been or haven't been, uh, you'll find out that the museum is sort of half movie theater and half exhibition space. So we have two movie theaters and I curate a series there that happens every month called Science on Screen, where I pick a film that has some kind of relationship to science and then I follow that with a conversation usually between a scientist and a filmmaker that sort of elucidates or highlights um, the scientific element in that film. And then in the galleries, uh, you know, as we were talking about, that's a matter of um, more long-term sort of research on projects. Mm -hmm. uh, I have a, an exhibition opening in October that is going to be a hologram. Um, mm -hmm. It's an artist who worked with an Australian company, a new holographic technology that he sort of hacked and created his own video for, and um, somewhere between sculpture and zoetrope and, uh, you know, 3D moving image uh, media. So those are all, you know, quite different areas, but the commonality is the kind of science and film intersection. Which is amazing. It's part of one of it's part of the work that we do as well with STEAM. And so, how do you because because you have this unique perspective of yeah. being able to see so many different intersections? How do you see science and art intersecting through film? Yeah, it's actually, um, you know, I think my well, my interest is manifold. But um, if you look at sort of the um, origins of the moving image. That's a really nice place that I like to start because, um, you know, a lot of people think of Moybridge, but his counterpart in, in uh, Europe was a physiologist who was named Etienne mm. Jules Murray, who, um, you know, was one of the progenitors of the movie camera that was really invented to study motion. Um, mm -hmm. It was invented to study human physiology. And so, you know, we think of the, uh, the horse moving, you know, the sequence of the horse uh, in motion, you know, the, the movie camera, the succession of images, you know, was really an analysis of motion um, developed by people who are interested in science and the body and all of that. So, um, you know, there's a lot of examples in terms of the development of cinematic technology that was uh, for scientific study. So there are these really interesting, you know, points in history where uh, science kind of spurred the development of actually like moving image technology that you know has continued to be iterated on so you know there's that long history and now i think people recognize much more uh sort of the um social impact political impact way that science is kind of integrated in our society and cinema and film being you know a very pervasive uh aspect of our culture is as other things you know a great way of um grappling with that and bringing that to people's attention. Absolutely. And so um, I'm curious in your role, what are some of the favorite exhibits that you've been able to kind of explore either now or in the past? I'd love some examples. Sure. Um, I had one that I was a lot of fun uh, to put together that was maybe two years ago and it was called a uh, Twitch Pop Bloom Science in Action. So, um, yeah, I had some fun with that title. So, you know, even uh, speaking about what we were just talking about, these sort of instances in uh, the history of cinema where uh, cinematic technology has been used to kind of reveal something mm -hmm. um, or, or uh, show something that hasn't before been seen. These, this was a selection of nine films that rotated in the course of uh, the ex exhibition. So the mm -hmm. first was called In the Lab and the second was called In the Field. So as you might imagine, some of them were filmed in a lab and some of them were filled, filmed in a field. And it was from 1904 to 1936. So sort of pre-sound, um, for the most part, cinema. Um, short films that uh, was a combination of, you know, the first films that were um, made of cells. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, through a microscope where people really invented their own technology. Mm -hmm. um, I had one of syphilis bacteria uh, that, um, you know, you wouldn't necessarily know it's that unless um, that was part of the framework, but it was actually uh, one of the first indicators of the way that syphilis, um, that you could diagnose syphilis from a blood mm -hmm. sample. Syphilis has a very specific um, 
bacteria that has like this wiggling motion and so the filmmaker made this film and and by showing it to the medical community you know that became a visual reference for diagnosing mm -hmm. syphilis before the disease progressed so you know and then there was also you know the first films of uh wildlife you know what has become you know a, a big genre nature filmmaking birds chirping and um you know the filmmakers at the time you know came up with these really crazy ways of um filming things because if you imagine the difficulty of filming wildlife with a really loud really heavy <laughs> hard to move camera that was the case in the 1920s and 30s you know that was no small feat so um that was a fun exhibition. I was able to, you know, present those films and present a lot of historical, uh, sort of contextual material. And um, yeah, coming up, I have this one opening in October uh, called Dissolution that um, is really like a sculptural plinth with a, uh, f a glass plate that vibrates at 30 frames a second and uh, creates the illusion of, um, you know, a solid three-dimensional projection. Um, and that's by an artist named David Levine. And yeah, I'm really looking forward to it. And simultaneously, we're also uh, redoing our whole core exhibition. And I'm part of a team that's working on that. That's so, awesome. Yes, lots for folks to look forward to. I yeah, think. absolutely. So what's yeah. your process? How do you decide? Because there's so much material out there, right? Yeah. So how do you decide as a curator what to select and what to let go of? Mostly you're letting go of things. I mean, I'll be honest, like, uh, <laughs> um, you know, we have limited space and resources. And um, I guess the nice thing about my job is that I have sort of various platforms to think about in terms of the way of presenting work. So at the very least, you know, if there's something that I love, I'll do an interview about it for the website. Um, if it's something that's just a film that doesn't necessarily need the space of a gallery, then that's great for the theaters. And you know, that what I show in the theaters is not always new work. So there's a, a long lifespan for, you know, work that I might find interesting. I've got a big back catalog. Um, and the galleries I think is the most challenging part in terms of sort of honing in on something that you really want to devote mm -hmm. like years to developing and fundraising for and things like that. And, you know, I mean, I'm part of a team. We have those discussions. Uh, I think there's you know, really a, a sweet spot that we're always sort of continuing to define of a work that, um, you know, some that we can provide enough material or mm -hmm. surrounding that someone can, you know, walk in off the street not knowing anything and they can find an entry point to it. Mm -hmm. yes. um, so sometimes, I, you know, I think the uh, dissolution, the holographic piece I was talking about is a good example in the ways that you know that technology itself relates to both like the past and sort of speculative future of what people think of as the moving image because if you look at early cinema technology that we have in our galleries there's a zoetrope and that's like you know a, a wheel and a moving screen and there's ways that this technology is really recalls that um so something where we can um make a connection ideally through our permanent uh, collection and you know the materials that we have on display to newer work that there's a bridge there um, mm -hmm. yeah is sort of a sweet spot but I'll say that um, together with my colleagues we also put together a film festival every year called First mm -hmm. Look um, and that's New York premieres of you know new international boundary pushing work um, and that's like a great way of showcasing work in a short period of time but you get to sort of do a lot and bring people together so I guess to answer your question, it's always a matter of finding new ways of, of showing as much work as we can um, mm -hmm. and thinking about audience and mm -hmm. a range of audiences and, you know, what uh, what would be, you know, the most appealing um, mm -hmm. to that kind of range and working with our education department thinking about that as well. Yeah, I don't think people realize um, how much goes into developing a gallery. Um, like you mentioned uh, that it's you have to do fundraising and that it can sometimes take years. Um, yeah. And so I think being able to select things that and have that in your mindset, um, how often, I'm just curious, how often yeah. do you change galleries um, or because if it does take years, I mean, how long do we, um, is that process? Yeah, I mean, as I mentioned right now, we're working on the core exhibition and that's gonna be like five plus years of, you know, 
um, just, I mean, we've had this thought for a long time, but five plus years of just kind of head down development, I think. Um, In terms of our changing exhibition galleries, uh, it's anywhere, you know, typically we like to have things on for longer than a month. So I'd Mm -hmm. say maybe three months is more typical. Um, Things, you know, we've had exhibitions that are really successful that we keep on view for six months. We have some pieces from on, on loan for Leica, from Leica right now mm-hmm. um, in our uh, sort of embedded within the permanent exhibition that is an example of stop motion animation and uh, people can come in and, and make their own little stop motion animations. And we just were able to extend that uh, through September. So, you know, um, yeah, they, the, that sort of, there's a range of lifespans, but, um, and each gallery, you know, has its own sort of parameters because we have, you know, one really big gallery. And so that Mm -hmm. gallery takes longer um, Mm -hmm. because that's more work to fill. We also exhibit work in our elevators. um, And uh, (laughs) uh, yeah, and that, you know, that changes every month or so. So um, yeah, so there's, there's a wide range, right? There's a range. I know. Sorry. No, 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 no concrete answer. Yeah, well, no, but that's that's great because I think sometimes we get stuck into this mindset of, you know, either we have to update, update, update because yeah. you know, the Instagram culture of, you know, five seconds and somebody's bored yeah. or um, thinking about long term, if this is going to exist for a period of years, what would be significant enough that invites when people come back, they see something new, perhaps totally. that they didn't see before. So I just, I think that process is fascinating to, to kind of take a look at. I want to switch gears a little bit because yeah. I know that you've created the uh, science and film teachers guide as a framework for, for um, kind of selecting short narrative films that examine scientific topics, right? So yes. what are some of the highlights the, from that, that teachers could maybe take away from that guide or even encourage them to pick it up? Yeah, of course, for sure. So I mentioned that one of the things that I do is I run this online publication that we have, which is called Sloan Science and Film. And that's a publication um, which together with many of the programs that I run, we receive funding for from a foundation called the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, which people mm-hmm. may have heard on Radio Lab or you know other WNYC shows. Um, but they have a program that's specifically devoted to public understanding of science. And they do that through many means, through funding of you know different organizations over 20 plus years. Um, and one of the sort of strongest of those or um, that which has like a, a robust sort of pipeline of development is a film program. And so they support um, student filmmakers uh, at the graduate school level for the most part, um, Mm -hmm. making short narrative films that integrate science. And I think what distinguishes those films from a lot of other films is that they're not documentary, they're narrative. So it's sort of a, Mm -hmm. um, they're fiction in other words. Mm -hmm. Um, So uh, there's a different kind of appeal, I guess, in terms Mm -hmm. of storytelling and thinking about filmmaking um, than documentary films might have. I mean, they're both totally valuable and I love them both, but this is a specific focus on narrative. And so um, part of the website's role is that we catalog all of those short films. Mm -hmm. Um, And a few years ago, you know, I was just thinking about ways of getting the word out that we have this resource and it's free. And um, I developed a teacher's guide that sort of reverse engineers the film. So if Mm -hmm. the students are thinking of a scientific topic and then interpreting it through a fiction lens, I'm sort of looking at what they're doing and you know reverse engineering it um, to ground it back in the science. And so what the teacher's guide does, and it's available for free online as a PDF, or you know you can download it or browse it online, um, is it gives you access a to watch all of the films. And so there's we have I think upwards of 80 films streaming oh, wow. on the site. The for the um, guide I selected 52. Um, I think I tried to keep it to 50, but that was hard. Um, (laughs) So um, yeah, it's a range of films. They're each cataloged by scientific topic. I tried to align that with, um, you know, New York and uh, nationwide science standards. So that Mm -hmm. was sort of, you know, picking general enough science topics. And then each one um, has age recommendations and then it has um, proposed discussion questions that mm-hmm. you know you could watch a film and then you know here's here are some topics that I think the film brings up and then links to resources 
um, where teachers and or students, you know, can can learn about um, the answers to some of those questions or other other kind of topics that the film brings up. Mm. So, yeah. That's so valuable. And, it's, and I love that you linked it to standards. I think that's something that sometimes um, when we're developing resources for teachers that that doesn't always happen. So thank you for that because yeah. I think it's so needed, right? Yeah. Um, but also the idea of being able to kind of uh, investigate more narrative films. I think of, I just went to go see Oppenheimer yeah. over the weekend. And I think about, um, it was interesting. I was having a discussion with um, a colleague who said, well, you gotta be careful with, with those films because you don't know if they're expanding the truth or if they're twisting the truth. And so um, I'm sure, and, and there's validity to that, but also I think it's interesting that the, the top, one of the top Google searches over the weekend was, uh, is Oppenheimer a real person <laughs> or, or was the atom bomb real? And I'm like, hello, we need more, uh, more discussion around science and history. Yeah. Um, and if filmmaking can help us to do that, to open up that world, I think it's so important. And so I love that you've brought this as kind of that film guide for teachers who are looking for resources like that. Yeah, um, definitely. And I hear you with oh, Oppenheimer. <laughs> oh, yeah, I know. I know. I'm like, wait a minute. Is that Yikes. really a Google search? <laughs> yeah. do some work here. Um, so uh, that kind of brings me to this um, this debate that is often had in education between STEM and STEAM. And, and you're right there at that intersection um, because of the way that you are, you are a curator. You have this artistic lens for looking at science. Um, but I'm curious about your take on the, the debate between STEM and STEAM because sometimes people, especially this is what I hear very often from, yeah. from folks who advocate for no STEAM, that it should be STEM, is that um, the the extra A, the the arts dilute the STEM instruction. So I'd love your perspective on that from what from what you do and what you see. Sure, I think I'm sure that you know more about this than me. I don't want to misrepresent. So no, <laughs> no but I love your take. I mean, because it, it's interesting as an as an educator, I can come at yeah. it from one angle, but you're coming at it from something totally different. So I'd love to, to hear from that. You know, I don't know if this has held true, but my when I first heard about that distinction many years ago, my original understanding of it was that the A, that the, you know, the art terminology was more of a reference to design mm -hmm. than art per se. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that those are really different things. Mm -hmm. um, yes. You know, just like, uh, I, you know, I could see an application of design thinking mm -hmm. to, um, you know, science education and science communication. And, you know, in fact, that is a real thing. I have a good friend um, who I'm working with right now who is a graphic designer um, who, who an illustrator who does all, you know, science focused things. And um, that's great. But um, you know, and that, that has a really broad appeal and, and you know, he, he does comics and all sorts of things. Um, design thinking applied to those things, I, you know, I have no issue with or like that, I feel like that, you know, could make a lot of sense depending on the educational setting and sort of what you're trying to teach. Art, as much as science, is also like, you know, a profession and a, mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and a, um, you know, and a, an industry and you know has a social and political context that I don't feel like that word or that acronym um, is alluding to. I feel mm -hmm. like it's sort of trying to say something maybe about creativity, um, but science, as we all know, um, you know, it, it is a process of sure. creativity um, depending on how you go about it. So. Yes, I don't know if that exactly answered your question. No, it, it does. But... It's interesting because, you know, I, over the years, you're right. Over the years when uh, STEAM was first to kind of distinguish, it was coming out of RISD, out right. of the design element, right? And over the years, it has expanded into all of the arts and the process of the arts themselves. And so it really does depend on where your definition is, yeah. um, what your understanding of it is, and how they converge. 
which I think, I mean, I, just knowing what, um, from the, the museum itself and what you're curating, I mean, there's, there's the process that you're using with the arts and the selection of it itself. And then the process of connecting science with the art form of filmmaking yes. is, can, can really work beautifully together. And I think it's a, it's a great way to investigate, as you said, entry points for, yeah. for people who are looking for both of those, right? Yeah, I mean, I guess I should emphasize that the, um, you know, while a lot of the things that I explore are sort of scientific topics in mm -hmm. um, film, it's also a lot like the science of film and filmmaking yeah. and, you know, how that fits in the acronym world. You know, I think a lot of times those, it's, an in, it's interesting as like a jumping off point for a debate, but I think yes. there is a utility to those acronyms and people are using them to signify a certain thing. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I don't exactly, you know, I wouldn't assume to know when that's useful for people and when that's not, because I imagine mm -hmm. there are things tied to funding and uh, oh, sure. all of that. <laughs> um, well, of course, but... but yes, the science of the technology of those things, you know, that, that also is a really good, you know, entry point to... Um, you know, then thinking about how to get into, you know, actually filmmaking and telling stories. And Absolutely. All of that. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So talking about, speaking of some barriers, um, can you share some barriers to filmmaking that in the classroom um, and then how teachers might be able to overcome some of those things? Yeah. Well, I am not a filmmaker and we have a great education department that is full of, you know, people who specialize in that and, mm -hmm. um, you know, one great, you know, barrier breaking activity they could do is bring their students here um, where we have lots of, of course, you yeah. know, media making workshops and we have a, a teen council that's full of teens, you know, that, that want to become filmmakers that sort of get mentored along the process. Um, in the galleries, we have lots of hands-on activities. You can make your own flip book, you know, stop motion animation, like I mentioned, you can sort of see the process of making films. But I mean, I, you know, like most things, I think there's a resource barrier. Mm -hmm. um, filmmaking equipment of a certain kind is obviously expensive. I think mm -hmm. phones have, uh, while obviously not accessible to everyone, have definitely, you know, democratized that kind of um, access. And, uh, but at the same time, it's like the kind of content that you know, TikTok and a lot of people are seeing like, are those films? I don't know. Um, they're moving images, but um, yes. there's, of course, a distinction, um, you know, between. Uh, yeah, I, and yeah, I think there's I, I don't want to say. No, no, no. But I think that's such a great point to make in that as we're we're rapidly evolving with technology, what what does count as a film? Yeah. Um, and what doesn't and kind of exploring that. Um, I do know that um, your website is an incredible resource. So um, I'd love to know how people could find you, could find the, the museum and how they might be able to stay in touch. Yeah, of course. Thank you for asking. Of course. Um, <laughs> so the website's really easy, scienceandfilm.org. Um, it is open, accessible, everything on it is free. Um, and, and that, you know, that's really the goal. And we just want as many people as possible to understand that it's a resource that's out there to support them. And of course, if they have any feedback, um, I'm very accessible on it. You know, I have like a bio page and there's a link that you can reach out directly and email me. Um, and, you know, the, the museum has a big, and, you know, we platform off of that has a big social following if people enjoy following Wonderful. things on social networks so um you know facebook and instagram and all the things and then you know our building has a lot of great things as well and we're located in astoria right off the r or the n or the w um trains and it's a beautiful day here so um that's today wonderful. and hopefully yeah. in the future <laughs> yeah absolutely wonderful yeah yeah. Yes. Yeah, so thank you so much for joining us today, Sonia. It has been so enlightening to hear your position and what you do. And I just think I, I thank you for um, the work that you're doing. I think it's in, in very so important for people in order to understand both the science and the art form. So thank you. Thank you so much.